tarde, eu sou Davi Ruiz, trabalho na Telefônica Digital e também sou curador da área de desenvolvimento aqui da, da Campus Party. Ao meu lado, Carlos Halley, também da Telefônica Digital, desenvolvedor responsável técnico pelo projeto do Fireware. Então, primeiramente, eu gostaria de fazer uma introdução, porque existem algumas dúvidas a respeito do que é o Fireware, ok? Então, o Fireware é um projeto da Comissão Europeia que visa posicionar a empresa, posicionar a, a, a União Europeia... Oi? Vamos lá. Então, o, Fireware, o, o objetivo do Fireware é posicionar a União Europeia à frente da internet do futuro. Então, o que é o Fireware? O Fire é um conjunto de especificações de cloud, de APIs voltadas à comunicação com a internet das coisas, armazenamento, a computação na nuvem, enfim, uma série de fatores onde o Carlos vai entrar no detalhe tecnicamente para vocês, ok? Então, o Fire é todo esse conceito e existe uma instância chamada FileLab, que é justamente o lugar onde vocês podem testar todo esse conceito. Então, todas as especificações que nós temos do Fireware, de internet das coisas, cloud, etc., no FileLab é a sua área para justamente realizar todos esses testes. Bom, Carlos Halley vai seguir aqui com a apresentação. Gostaria de abrir a oportunidade aqui para ele falar e seguir com a apresentação aqui. Obrigado. Muito, muito obrigado, David. Então, so, você pode me ouvir? Ok. Muito obrigado, David. Boa tarde a todos. Uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot speak Portuguese, so I'm going to make this presentation in English. And uh, as David said, my role here is to try to explain to you what is Fireware, what you can do with a Fireware platform, and uh, what you cannot do with Fireware, what is on your side, and uh, also how we think that we can establish a win-win collaboration So you benefit from Fireware and we benefit from developers, right? So the first thing is uh, what do we mean when we talk about the future internet, right? Uh, the point is that we believe that we are bringing a lot of new resources into the internet. That means open data, that means uh, internet of things, elements like sensors, actuators, etc. But we are bringing a lot of web developers as well. I don't know if this is because of that. And uh, we believe that because of all these resources that we are bringing into the internet, there will be an, ex an explosion of services, right? And uh, these services will be uh, within different vertical sectors. Sectors like e-health, like energy, management, like tourism, like agriculture, etc. So besides all the services that we are able to access today in the internet, we believe that there will be completely new ecosystems on these vertical sectors. We think that the key for success is a little bit uh, parallel to the mobile platforms ecosystems and uh, consists in bringing developers into the development of the services. So, the main question, what is, we use this better? Okay, okay, this is much better. <laughs> I'm sorry for the previous sounds. So, what is Fireware? Fireware is a software platform, right? Uh, it's made of enablers, software components, and uh, we aim to provide this to you so you can build future internet applications, that means the applications in these vertical sectors, in a very easy and fast way, right? It's targeted to web developers. So if you have experience developing services for Google APIs, for Facebook, for LinkedIn, it should be trivial for you to come up with applications for in the future internet scope with us, okay? Besides the components themselves, we are trying to build an ecosystem. We believe it's not only to provide the services to make your life easier as developers, but also to bring into the system uh, open data from cities, sensor data from cities, etc. So when you are a developer and you come to our platform, you have uh, an actual instance in the cloud, and therefore 
you have all this data available, right? It's not only the services provided by the components, but also all the information coming from these cities or from these other companies collaborating into the ecosystem. One important thing as well that we are providing is that all our components are given with the open specifications, open APIs. We, we always use REST APIs. There could, be another, there could be other options, but we believe this is the most uh, easy to be used by web developers, right? And uh, in the beginning, not all the components were open source, but we are guaranteeing that for each generic enabler, there will be always one uh, reference implementation that is open source, right? So what is behind the file app concept? The file app is basically an instance of the fireware platform running in the cloud, right? There could be many in instances of fireware running in different data centers, but what we are doing is we are providing one global instance for your convenience, right? So if you are a web developer, one of the things that you need to know is first the components of the software platform of fireware, but also you need to know the location of the file app in the internet and you need to open an account so you can start to roll out your applications, okay? And uh, as I said before, the, the key idea is to build the ecosystem so you are able to exploit also all the open data and all the information from the sensors that we are collecting. So how we organize the components that uh, we are delivering in our platform? We have organized them into different technical categories. So you have a category for Internet of Things. That means that we have some enablers that may help you right, to develop your applications, integrating sensors, etc. There are cloud components, there are components for data analysis, there are components re related to the applications, mainly user interfaces and a marketplace, and there is a central element that we call the context broker that I will be explaining later. That is a kind of glue uh, among all the components, right? It's basically a public subscribe of notifications that you can use to push information and to pull information in both synchronous and asynchronous mode. And of course, to access the platform, in the end, you need some security system. And for that, we are using one enabler that is called Identity Manager, and that is based on the OAuth 2.0 technology that I'm sure you are very used to, to deal with because it's the standard used by Google and others. So, said before, um, we have a number of things connected to the fireware ecosystem, to the file app, right? And uh, this is a picture of uh, some things that we have already connected. But uh, we, this is an ongoing process, and whenever we perform new hackathons, new challenges, we are connecting more cities, and we are under negotiation with other locations as well. So in the beginning, we started with the city of Santander in Spain, because they have an amazing deployment of sensors in the city. It's like the reference smart city in Europe. They have more than 8,000 uh, sensors developed today. They have air quality, they have weather, they have traffic, car traffic measurement, they have parking sensors, and they have really a lot of things. And uh, in Seville, we are connecting uh, an anonymized platform of water consumed in more than 500 uh, uh, houses. In Trento, in Italy, we are connecting a number of resources, in Zaragoza as well, and in the city of Malaga in South Spain. And one of the things that I can advance you today is that we are negotiating in some countries in Latin America to bring up here also some uh, data from cities, right? I know there is something going on in Brazil and I know there is something going on in Chile at this moment, right? And it will be announced as part of the, the website. So if I am trying to encourage you to exploit Fiverr as a platform and the file app instance in the cloud, I think it's worth to, to start to describe how we started the exploitation ourselves, right? We believe that a platform has no sense if there are no developers joining it and if there is no ecosystem behind, right? So we, I want to clarify as well that the fireware is not just uh, an, in an initiative coming, coming up from some companies, but uh, it comes because in the European Union, the politicians and some public authorities realized that when we talk about uh, platforms, many of the services come from the US, right? And it's not that the things come only from the US in the sense that they are worldwide available, but uh, we are losing the track in Europe for this kind of innovation. Then we are not uh, involving in the correct way developers in Europe. 
and at the same time, as we saw lately with the NSA scandals, uh, that puts the U.S. authorities also in a better position to do exactly as they as they feel with the information of the citizens inside the U.S. but also outside the U.S. Right. So this is the reason why the Commissioner Nelly Cross decided to to launch uh, a public-private partnership that basically is a huge program uh, where more than 300 million euros are, are spent together with the main companies in Europe to create a platform that is open source and is offered to developers, right, on a way that we have alternatives, for instance, to the Amazon AWS service, right, but also we offer many other services thanks to these enablers, correct? So the inauguration of the Future Internet Lab, this file lab, was made in the past campus party in London last year, September last year, and it was inaugurated by this commissioner, Nelly Cross. I think it's important because it's not so often when politicians have a look to developers and to us, and they try to address our needs. So I think it's a good opportunity, and this is why companies like Telefonica are trying to, to do this and to provide to provide the magic for developers so we can create these future internet scenarios, right? And as part of the campus party in Europe, we started our first hackathon, right? In the beginning, we, we learned a lot with the experience of the hackathons because we have clear in our minds which are the components that we are delivering, but uh, later on you discover how developers actually want to use them and also they classify very well what is useful and what is not useful and how is the level of the documentation that normally is very poor coming from the projects of the companies, right? So they help, they help us a lot. So the, first, uh, the f very first result that we had in the campus party of uh, London was a first prize. This was a team of four guys, 17 years and 18 years old guys, and it was amazing. We were giving them a workshop like the workshop that we are giving tomorrow here on fiber enablers and uh, this was four, four hours workshop and only with that information in five days they were able to code this application that was basically an application to show advertisements on the on panels on the streets and the advertisements uh, could be selected uh, depending on the weather conditions or, uh, if there were people in front of the panel or not with these uh, present sensors and many other things. They develop also a database so the advertisement companies could push their ads uh, uh, almost in real time and uh, they provided the source code in, G in the GitHub so they made an amazing work only in five days. So this is only an example of how developers can get things like our components and try to generate the scenarios, right? Then we kept on and the next hackathon was done in the city of Santander to try to exploit this amazing number of sensors that they have in the city. And uh, the result was even better than in London. We were giving four prizes there. The first one was related with some devices that you connect to TVs and then you make the, these are Android devices that uh, can overlay on the TV um, some text or even graphics. And they were exploiting this for public spaces like museums. So you could be watching some advertisement on a screen or, or whatever information the museum wants to offer to the, to the visitors. And at the same time, you could see an overlay of uh, which rooms are completed uh, or are not full at that moment, so you can go to the ones that are empty and you can better see the pictures, etc. right? And the second prize was related to integrating robots, for instance, with our platform. And the third one was uh, just to build a, the typical if-then uh, application in the cloud, but in a very easy way, right? And this was made, again, by some two, three developers in this in the timeline of three, four days, right? So that shows how, how we believe that the application can really make your life easier. So for the campus party of Brazil, what we started is uh, more long-term challenges because so far I have described uh, what we call on-site uh, hackathons. That means that the developers have three, four days only, so it's quite limited, right? But uh, these long-term challenges the developers have had more or less like three months, right, to develop their ideas, and they are presenting their ideas this, during these days 
to a jury of the project and we are seeing uh, very good things. We are giving the prices this, this Friday, we are making the selection and I believe we are giving the prices on, right on Friday as well. So the good, the good news is that uh, in the challenges of hardware, we are giving more than 800,000 euros in prices. The Campus Party of Brazil was only the first round, so we are giving more prices. So this is a little bit incentive for you guys. If you want to develop applications with fiber, you can start to try, and you are eligible then to participate in our contest as well, okay? But we don't think this is the most important. I think it's more important that the people get to know the platform and get to know how to use it, right? But normally it works very well as an incentive for the people because at the end it's a work to, to be done, right? So this was more or less the overall presentation. So from all the previous slides, the only important thing is the concept of Fiverr as a software platform, the Lab as a global instance, and the experience that we have by the hackathons and challenges that normally it's easy to get to have an, a future internet application developed in some days, okay? And now, let's go to the meat of the presentation, trying to tell you how you could be getting started with this, okay? So there are six very easy steps. First one would be to have an idea, right? Just develop your idea of a service in one of these vertical sectors that we have mentioned before, like can be e-health, energy, tourism, agriculture, events, organization, I don't know, whatever you think it could be part as a service of the future, right? And uh, yes, normally we say a number of uh, vertical sectors, but I believe that the future is not written. So I am sure in the hackathons, the people will be showing us as well many new kind of applications that we were not expecting before, right? The second step would be once you have your idea, you need to get to, to the Fiverr website and to the Fiverr catalog that I will present later. And you need to read a little bit about the different enablers that we have that I'm going to introduce also in this presentation, right? Then you don't need to get all the enablers or a minimum set of enablers. This, you are completely free to pick up just one enabler if it's convenient for you and use it. You can use one, two, three, four, all, whatever you think is useful for you, right? And uh, third step would be once you know which components you, you will be using, you should open an account in the file app, right? Which is totally free, of course. And uh, there you will be able to get some free virtual machines available for you, for the backend, for the logic of your application, in case you need it. Normally we give up to three, but if you need more, we can discuss this, all right? So when there is a special need, we, we don't have normally any problem because we have uh, quite a wide capacity and uh, once uh, once you have deployed your your virtual machines in the cloud that I will explain how you can do it this later uh, then you need to develop the logic of your application and to establish the glue among all the different components that is pretty easy because as I said before we work with rest APIs so normally it should be an easy job for you in your favorite language say C++ Python whatever right and once you have developed your application you should work a little bit the integration just to test that everything works fine and test test and test okay so just few words about where to find the information in the overall sense there, there is of course the website of the project there is a wiki with a lot of technical information but I think the main window to come at the first stage is the fiber catalog right is a catalog.fiber.eu this presentation will be available, so you will be able to see the link and all the references that we are providing here. And the, there is a tag that the, I don't think you can read, but it's called Enablers. And there you will see a classification in these technical chapters that I mentioned before. Applications, cloud, Internet of the Things, etc. And there you are able to see which are the generic enablers. You can see all the details of the instance of these enablers that are running in the cloud as well, how you can access them, right? In case you need an individual instance for you, we, you, can, you have an email address to request that in case you, you want to play with something for, for a private testing, let's say. And also you have their links to all the manuals, documents, the, the team supporting you, etc. So let's go now a little bit, one degree uh, deeper. 
And this is more or less the, what we are going to, to explain for the remaining time of the presentation, right? I hope it's not too much, uh, but uh, I think it's, it should be quite useful for you to have a first view of all the enablers. That, um, you cannot see all the enablers here, but I am trying to present the ones that we see that developers use the most, okay? And uh, th these ones that we believe that are more useful for your applications, according to our experience in this contest. So the first thing that I'm going to start with will be the IoT, and there we, we have two enablers. One is this called DCA, Data Collection and Acquisition, that sometimes we call IDAS as well. And then the fifth way, which is a, which is a kind of open source that we developed for the Raspberry Pi, in case you want to connect your own sensors, right, that are not using the standard technology that you, we use in IDAS. So we are providing this as a kind of easy connection to our, to our system. Then I will go to the data analysis exactly on the left side. And there I think we have two main ones, which is the big data. This will allow you to store massive amounts of data from your customers, from your products, for, for everything that you deal with in your application, right? And also you will have the typical uh, tools to perform map and reduce analysis, non-SQL, access to the databases, etc. There is another G in the data field that I would like to explain today, that is uh, the multimedia stream-oriented G, right? Then I will move to the context broker that I said that is more or less like the glue of everything. I will describe more or less which is the strategy that we selected to, to develop or publish subscribe. And uh, later the cloud, where we can see three Gs, the virtual servers, the object storage, and the platform as a service manager, right? And finally, in the applications, the wild cloud and the marketplace, and sorry, finally, the one is the IDM, which is the, the OAuth 2.0. That, that is just to connect in a secure manner with uh, all the APIs of the platform, right? Is it okay so far? You have uh, any question? Do you want me to stress on something before I go into the details? Okay. Perfect. Feel free to interrupt me because I think we have plenty of time and we will not consume it all, right? Um, before going into every component that I introduced before, um, as, I, as I said, you can always pick up only the enablers that you want, okay? So normally, you will have your S scenario for your specific application, where you have the backend, typically the backend of your application, you have this enabler of fiber, this enabler of fiber, this enabler of fiber, you interconnect them this way, and then you interconnect them together with your, the logic of your application and your user interfaces, and that's it. But any, anyway, this is a reference scenario, right? This is just an, as an, just an example that normally we use in the hackathons because, as I told you, these were normally four days contest. So if we wanted the people to build their own reference scenarios, that was a kind of nightmare. So, and this, I think it's very useful to explain to you how we connect the things many times. So starting from the bottom to the top of the slide, on the left-hand side, you can see that we have some sensors. In this case, we were using, for instance, the Save Wave technology that you know is a kind of radio mesh technology. It's quite cheap, so it's normally used for home automation, right? And uh, it's short range communication over the, over the radio mess. And uh, we have developed this Figway software, which is basically on a number of open source tools that translate the register and the observations of the sensors into sensor ML, right? Sensor ML is the standard that is used in many Internet of Things platforms, and also in the one that we are using in the project, that is these two blue. Uh, servers that are called DCA IDAS. This is the IoT uh, generic enabler. Okay? So you can see you have the sensors that send the notifications in their own protocol, and thanks to our tools in the Raspberry Pi, you translate this into sensor ML. On the other side, we have cities that they have their own gateways for Internet of Things, and they are, let's say, smart enough to support the sensor ML protocol, right? 
and therefore they don't need any kind of adaptation like the one we are doing with the Raspberry Pi on the left side. And therefore they send sensor ML uh, notifications directly to the, to the Internet of Things. And then these two Internet of Things instances forward the notifications using the context broker protocol, right? That I will explain later. And this context broker, as I said before, is the glue among everything. This is uh, the typical component where you have context producers that deliver the information to this, uh, to this broker. And then you have your application, the big data, the user interface that consume the notifications because they are subscribed to the context broker, right? And therefore, the big data and the, and the user interface, they don't have to care they, they don't care about the low-level protocols of the Internet of Things or whatever you are using because they just consume the notifications in the standard protocol of the context broker, right? So in this sense, it's pretty easy for you to develop an application with a context broker because context broker can interface with everything and then you only need to query the context broker so you only need to learn the protocol and the API of the context broker for that, right? Of course, if you want to do more things, you can learn details about the others and then you, you, you can uh, access certain functionalities that are not accessible through the context broker, right? But as a first stage, to, to start with the context broker as an interface to your application is a very good idea. So using this reference scenario, I will describe a kind of overview of each one of these components that I mentioned before. I think it's a lot of information. I would be happy if you only remember the G's and uh, wh what they are useful for, right? And that you know that uh, for every enabler that I'm explaining here today, there is a slide with all the references where you can find not only these slides, but also slides on the enabler, its architecture, the manual for the user and programmer, etc. right? So this, is, this presentation should be a very good starting point that uh, you, can, you can pull from this thread and uh, you can go in step by step, right? So the first GE that I would like to, to explain is actually the couple of Gs that is this uh, Figway running in the Raspberry Pi and the Internet of Things DCA IDAS, right? As I said before, normally the Internet of Things platform consumes sensor ML notifications from the sensors and we can send commands also using the REST API. What we have done is to build these functions that take the save wave interface in the Raspberry Pi by using a save wave module. And we push with these functions that are, are developed in C, in the standard C, and you have the sources, so you can easily modify. They, forward, they translate the save wave notifications into sensor ML, so they are pushed to our server. To our server. Someone could get this software, this Figway software, and easily modify it to, pu to push uh, Zigbee sensors information. In many hackathons, the people have been connecting an Arduino board to the Raspberry Pi, for instance, or I2C sensors directly to the GPIO interface of the Raspberry Pi. And um, as I said before, these C files are pretty easy to be modified in order to push this, uh, this sensor information as sensor ML to the Internet of Things. And then that uh, generic enabler automatically translates everything into the NGSI protocol that is what the context broker is using. Okay, So you don't have to care about that. You just need to modify these functions and you push the information to the DCA, which pushes the information in turn to the context broker. These are references that we include. So you have the entry in the catalog and in the entry on the catalog, you have all the details to access all the services that we have configured, including a testing service and manuals for you, okay? Including the access to the GitHub for this uh, Raspberry Pi software. Now it's the turn of the context broker. As I said before, the context broker is for us the central element of the platform. And uh, we selected the OMA, the Open Mobile Alliance NGSI standard, right? So it's not something that we develop ourselves, but it's a, an, an, an existing standard. We choose this because it's pretty simple, but at the same time, quite powerful. Uh, the way we model the reality with this is that we have context elements 
and we forward notifications regarding on the context variations, right? And these context elements are basically entities and their and and their uh, sorry their parameters, right? So entities can be, for instance, a sensor like an electrical regulator, but it can be also a person, a technician that has to go to solve any problem. It can be a specific problem or issue that somebody has to solve, or it can be a vehicle that is taking the technicians somewhere. And the parameters, uh, the context parameters that these entities have are every kind of. So, uh, uh, for instance, for a person, for a technician, there can be the mobile number to locate this person. For the electrical regulator, you can have the battery charge or the electric potential, etc. Right? So, uh, as you can as you can imagine, almost every scenario that you figure out in your applications can be modeled as this, because you only have to model uh, the entities that you want to manage and which are their parameters, right? And uh, the way it works, it's pretty easy. You connect to the context broker when you are a provider of information, right? So, on the on the left side, you can see which are the operations related to how to discover context producers and context consumers. And on the right-hand side, you have the NGSI 10, that is the actual data that we are forwarding. Right? This is a little bit like the signaling and the data itself. right? Because with NGSI, NGSI 9, I'm able to discover which are the context producers. So for instance, I can query the context broker and say, I want to know all the context producers that are providing me the temperature of uh, this area, of this geographic area, right? You make that kind of query, and then the context broker will answer you with the context producers that are giving this information to you. And once you know these context producers, you can use the NGSI 10 queries to ask, to, to query these context producers. For instance, I want to know the temperature in this uh, provided by this context producer, for instance. Or you can subscribe to a context producer to receive the notifications asynchronously, right? So this is very powerful for your applications because in the scenario that we were describing of the city of Santander, say, for instance, that you want to know what is the temperature in the coastline of Santander and you want to compare, I don't know, one beach compared to another, etc. So you can query the context broker and you, you can use regular expressions to say, I want to know temperature, I want to know this, and I want to cover this geographical area. And then the context broker will let you know which entities are provided by which uh, context producers. And once you, your application has this information, when you need some update, you can query the context broker asking exactly for that. Or you can say, no, I want to subscribe, and whenever there is a change, I want to be notified. Okay. So this is the logic of a context broker, and these are the references for this, uh, for this component. As I said before, normally this is a very central component. So normally what we have seen is that developers use the virtual machines for the logic of the application and at least the context broker. Sometimes when they have Internet of Things uh, uh, sensors or whatever, they also use uh, the Internet of Things is. But some other applications, maybe they don't need that. Okay. So now I move forward to the other component that is related to the data analysis, right? That is the big data. And here I will not extend a lot on the details, but uh, what I will say is that we are providing this Cosmos G that it basically is providing three things. First, the computing capabilities, right? That is based in Hadoops. Map and reduce. I think it's quite well known because this is a technology that was was pushed forward by by Google. We are offering massive storage capabilities with the HDFS file system. So the good thing of this is that you don't have to know a lot of uh, details on how the big data technology works because you will have a REST API where you can create data sets and you can push information to your data sets or you can pull information from your data sets. And uh, you will have also access to SQL-like tools to perform analytics, right? So it's quite powerful and it's a, let's say, very easy way to get introduced to the big data, okay? And uh, I, I was saying all the time 
that you can create your data sets, you push information, you pull information, or you perform analytics. But also, you can access some open data that we have av available in the big data, okay? So besides the information of your customers, your products, whatever, that maybe that is private for your application, some, some smart cities are, are providing a lot of information regarding their cities, and you can access this information, right? And you can make that information part of your service. So just as an example of which kind of information the cities are providing to us, besides the sensors, for instance, in the, in the city of Seville, they are providing the census, that means all the data about the citizens that live in the city of Seville, the age distribution, right, and, and many of these data. So this is sometimes very useful to be able to perform marketing studies, to, to, to try to foresee which are your potential customers, right, in terms of numbers, to build a, a business model, etc. There are other cities, for instance, like Malaga, in the south of Spain, that are providing so useful information as the plaques of uh, certain insects tracking, right? So imagine maybe you could make an application that correlates the, the plaques incidents uh, of some insects or bees or whatever uh, with, the, with the weather conditions and with different neighborhoods of the cities. Right, so you could uh, you could offer to the to the citizens a forecast on what, uh, of of when a plaque is going to happen, right? And this is something that uh, could be very easily built because you have all the information available. You have the REST APIs to access this, and you just have to build the logic of your application, your user interface, etc. Okay, so let's say that you can focus on the on the meat of your idea and let the the, the complex services to be solved by the Fiverr platform. Here you have all the references to, uh, to this Cosmos, Big Data Generic Enabler, and the, the first steps that you should be doing also, the first should be to ask an account, right? You first ask for the FileLab account, but also if you want to create your own data, data sets, you need to open an, an account for the Cosmos. And then you have two ways to manage and use the data, right? I will not go into the details, and there you have more, like further information. So don't worry, because I will make this presentation available, so you will have all these links for your convenience, right? And then I wanted to present as well another G, another enabler that is related with the data analysis as well, and that is quite useful because uh, it solves all the complexity of processing multimedia. Right? We all have seen these applications and we have a demo in our fiber stand that is right there on the wall. Um, where you are in front of a camera, of a webcam, and uh, the, in the, on the screen you can see an augmented reality scenario where you have a different background and uh, it puts a, a hat, a pirate hat to you, uh, or the Darth Vader mask, right? But this is, the important is not what we are doing there, but how easy is for your application to make that? Because you are providing to the REST API the link to the video stream, then the GE consumes this video stream, and as an output, gives you another video stream with that result, depending on the configuration that you requested to these to this enablers, right? So basically, the summary is that they help you to send and receive multi multimedia and to process that, right? and uh, to avoid that you have to go into the complexity of video analysis, okay? And there are more than 10 uh, media elements that you could be using, and uh, you have the description in the documentation. But I have, I have chosen two. One is a little bit funny, is this Jack uh, Barder filter. That is the one that you can see the demo there. You will have your Dark Vader or your Pirate Hat, depending on what you select with a virtual reality interaction. And then there is another one that is maybe not so visual, but uh, maybe it's more useful sometimes. That is uh, just a, a decoder for the, for the um, barcodes, including uh, bidimensional ones, the VDs, okay? So this is very easy. You provide the, the link to the image, and then it decodes that, and it provides you with information, right? And here you can find all the references and uh, 
you will see that there are there are many very useful things like for instance uh, I remember in one of the hackathons uh, one uh, one person uh, made a detector uh, of uh, of uh, crowds in the events right so he had a camera and he was using one media element that was counting faces right so basically the guy uh, was getting uh, was subscribed to the notifications of this uh, media element that had connected the camera and when the number of faces were over 20 you say there is a there is a crowd here it's overcrowded so maybe something could happen or maybe they are giving t-shirts i don't know so you send the notification to the context broker and then he had the, possi the he had the possibility that users subscribe their mobiles to different notifications so say that maybe i am here in the campus party and uh, I cannot see what is going on on the other pavilion, but I uh, subscribe with the mobile to that application, and it, it get, I get a, a notification that says, in the pavilion of Intel or whatever, there are more than 100 people. So they are giving something for sure. So then I want to rush there, and, and I want to get my present as well. Okay? So just a little bit of uh, joking or kidding to, to explain you what the people are are using the fiber components for. Then we have the wire cloud. The wire cloud is a user interface a component, but this does not try to, or does not attempt to, to provide a full user interface uh, uh, platform. Because in the end, most of the people are building their own, their own user interfaces in mobiles with the iOS native applications or Android native applications or Firefox HTML5. Uh, applications, web applications in that case. Uh, but sometimes when you are developing an application, what you want is to rapidly build uh, prototypes, right? So what we are providing is a kind of dashboard made of widgets that you design yourself and uh, you collocate all them together in a web page. So you have like a dashboard with all the widgets and uh, maybe with that you can access uh, that actuator, that switch on, that light, and then you test that all your platform is working correctly. Maybe you have another button that is uh, take an image and forward it to the, to the object storage that we have in the cloud or whatever, right? The story is that uh, widgets are not very popular today, but for prototyping they work very well because, for instance, this is a widget that we built for this, uh, this reference scenario of the city of Santander and uh, once everything was connected uh, the widget was made in four minutes by one developer and we we were taking we, we were measuring the time and uh, you can see uh, he put the map so whenever the notification was arriving the the map focuses automatically on that uh, geographical spot then you had all the details of the sensor that was measuring that, uh, that alarm and uh, you can connect your widgets to other widgets to combine more complex widgets or you can even provide widgets to operators that are uh, kind of widgets that are not shown in the dashboard but they perform calculations that you need to 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 make some some data available for the widgets and one good thing is that these widgets can be published and can be shared in the marketplace so later on if somebody wants to use for instance this Santander widget and modify it, you can just download from the marketplace and you don't start from scratch, right? So these are the references to this wild cloud and you have even videos of the examples of how to build these, uh, these widgets. So I am close to the end because I know it's a lot of information and you are sweating, I'm sweating as well, <laughs> believe me. This is one of the most important because this is related to the cloud. And in the end, the very basic thing that FileWare, that FileLab is offering to you is a hosting in the cloud, right? Many, we saw that many developers, when they need to have some infrastructure in the cloud, they go to the Amazon AWS service that is, uh, that is managed by this uh, US company, right? So in FileWare, we are doing this thing a la European style, right? So you have uh, three virtual machines available for you, but you can ask for more. We are based on OpenStack, right? So we have all the capabilities that OpenStack has for uh, its virtual cloud solutions. And uh, you can choose 
for if you want to deploy your own virtual machines, you can select between some Ubuntu and CentOS versions. So depending the flavor of Linux that you, you would like to use, you can choose. And uh, basically this is all for the virtual machines provisioning. Then we have the cloud storage. And uh, this is pretty important because you don't need to you don't need to provide the, um, let's say, the storage yourself or to uh, store all the data of your applications in these virtual machines. You have this cloud storage service that is providing you a distributed, high availability, fast and secure service for you. So for instance, say that your application is a citizen, uh, it's, a, it's an application for citizens to, to report when there is something broken in the, in the cities, right? So you go with your mobile, you see that, uh, that the traffic light is broken, then you take a picture and you send the picture to the cloud storage because the, the logic of the application has prepared the, has prepared the scenario for that. And then all these things are stored there, so later your application can access the, the file there. Okay? So you can see that it's pretty easy and quite powerful. And this is for sure one of the GEs that most of the teams participating in the contest, hackathons or whatever, they are, they are using, right? Because you can, use, you can store any kind of file, right? Finally, from the standpoint of cloud, we have uh, this platform as a service manager. The idea behind this is basically that, as I said before, you can deploy your virtual servers with our OpenStack-based solution. But sometimes we, we want not only to deploy a, an Ubuntu machine or a CentOS machine, but I would like a service that I click a button and I get my, my SQL uh, or my MongoDB database installed in a server, so it's ready to use, right? So this is what we call this uh, blueprint, right? And we have several blueprints depending on the experience that we have seen in the, in the different hackathons. The most common one is this one. We call it uh, Fiber One. And when you push the button to deploy this blueprint, you get one server with a context broker. That is a private instance of the context broker, not the global one, that maybe will be used by your, the logic of your application and your, and your private things. There is another server with the MongoDB database, right? And there is from two to five servers with the Tomcat for the front end of your application, right? So you can see that you don't have to de deploy your virtual machines and then install the software and configure the services, but sometimes you have the template ready, so you just click a button and in some seconds you get everything deployed, right? Here are the references for this cloud geez. and this is the final one I promise there are no not not many more slides I just two slides more I think this is the security right uh, as I said before we are providing rest API's so anyone in the internet could go access the rest API and push a lot of garbage to our databases or they could destroy your services or whatever so what we have is a security system, the identity management, that guarantees that at least we can trace where the, where the problems are, right? Because of course, we have suffered from hackers already that they come to our platform because as it's open to everyone, they open an account and they, they don't use the platform to build uh, app services, but to, to try to make their attacks, right? Because <laughs> they have at the end uh, some, uh, some components in the cloud for, <laughs> for their convenience as well. But of course we monitor this continuously and in any case you open your account with Fiverr and basically if you know a little bit how OAuth 2.0 works, when your web application is trying to access the GIS, you are actu you're actually redirected to the identity management, right? Because you are using the OAuth libraries and uh, you use the, the password that you have been assigned together with your Fiverr account. And uh, if the access code is okay, you get an access token uh, on your side, and the, the backend applications, the GEs, they get this access token as well. So in the end, we can proxy only the, the queries that come from authenticated users. The result is quite transparent for you guys. You just need to use the OAuth 2.0 libraries, right? So that means that normally when you are accessing the context broker, you will be providing your access code, and then 
your application will get automatically the, the token that will be that will be used as one of the HTTP headers, and that's it. Okay. And once you are using that that token and you are accessing from that URL, everything should work fine. You know how this works, Antonio. So maybe you can explain to the people later as well. <laughs> and this is the reference for the IDM. Okay. So as I promised, this is the this was the last slide. And uh, I hope it wasn't too much. I tried to summarize as much as possible. But uh, this is basically what we are offering. Um, I don't think we are able to do anything without you, the developers, your ideas. So we are in the fiber stand all these days. So if you want to start to play with this, come, come to the stand and we will try to provide feedback to you. Okay? Thank you very much for your, for your attention. <laughs>